Wolf and Bessie Feinberg Foundation. The Dow Jones Industrial Average pumps its way back above the 7,000 mark, closing just shy of 7,009 on a good news, bad news kind of day. Good evening. I'm Cassie Seifert in New York. And I'm Jeffy Astin in Miami. Paul Kangas is off tonight. There's a $460 million buyout in the insurance business, solidifying the position of an industry leader. And does this look like the tip of the iceberg of a $12.5 billion industry? You may be surprised to see the rest of it. Nightly Business Report is brought to you by Digital, helping all kinds of businesses, like the American Stock Exchange, protect their information technology investment. Digital, whatever it takes. Franklin Templeton, serving investors for over 50 years. Franklin Templeton. And now, Mutual Series, investment products distributed by investment professionals. A.G. Edwards, providing financial advice and services for businesses including investment banking, cash management, and retirement plans. A.G. Edwards, trusted advice, exceptional service. The Dow Jones Industrial Average tacked on almost 47 more points today as it once again approaches record territory. It did so despite an economic report that gives rise to fears of an overheating economy and a confusing budget situation in Washington. We have two reports, beginning with Scott Gervey in New York. The markets continued their advance, one that can only be described as relentless. The Dow is now less than 100 points off its all-time closing high, and today's move came in spite of very strong economic news. The Commerce Department reported that the economy grew at the rate of 5.6% in the first quarter. That's the biggest jump in a decade, and more than double the rate most economists believe is sustainable without inflation. It's just once again the worry that the Fed will become nervous about a potential for inflation, figuring that if the, market, the economy stays this hot for this long, we will get some inflation. And one of the best measures of inflation, the implicit price deflator, advanced at a 2.3% annual rate in the quarter, while the fixed weight measure of price changes advanced at a 2.7% rate. Both of these inflation measures show significant increases. Still, while the initial market reaction was negative, it was not a big sell-off. And by mid-morning, both stocks and bonds were once again on the plus side. At the day's high, stocks were up nearly 100 Dow points. The markets were reacting to later reports from economists reviewing the data. They focused on an unexpected buildup of inventories in spite of a big jump in consumer sales. Their analysis says that with consumer confidence already falling in April, sales should also be falling. And that, plus the working down of those big inventories, will slow the economy. The market thinks that today's news is excellent news because, yes, growth was very rapid, but there's probably more moderate growth ahead. And as long as growth remains moderate, at least according to the market, the market is very hopeful the Fed won't need to tighten monetary policy, interest rates won't go up, in which case it's just clear sailing. One other factor encouraging the market bulls today was the general belief that a budget agreement is near in Washington. But Washington insiders are not so confident. Darren Gersh has that side of the story. The market rally was helped along by news a budget deal appeared to be near. But the president and Republican leaders, while optimistic, were far more restrained than Wall Street. get an agreement that does all those, that, that is, balances the budget, but also continues to invest in the areas that our people need to grow the economy, then I will support it. And we're, we're working hard. We worked hard yesterday. And uh, perhaps it will happen. The White House and Republicans are still about $75 billion apart on the issue of non-defense discretionary spending. That's money for the president's top priorities of education, welfare, and children's health. The increased spending is still the sticking point, Republicans say, but they did not call it a breaking point. You know, we're down now talking about, uh, I don't know the exact number, but let's just say somewhere in the range of between 50 and $100 billion of difference in a $2 trillion budget agreement. Uh, you ought to be able to find a way to, to work that uh, out. Today's strong economic news may be one way to do just that. Tax receipts have been stronger than expected, which may lower this year's deficit to $70 billion. If Republicans agreed to use the administration's more optimistic estimates of tax receipts, 
it would shave $110 billion from the projected deficit over the next five years. Sources say negotiators are also still looking at savings from adjusting the way the government calculates the consumer price index. I think the president and the leaders of Congress are about an inch away from a solution, but uh, that inch uh, could be a chasm. It could be very difficult to close that inch because it consists of the most difficult issues. If a deal is reached soon, the White House and congressional leaders know they will still have to sell it to members of their respective parties. And that may prove as difficult as these many weeks of closed-door negotiations. Darren Gersh, Nightly Business Report, Washington. The conflicting interpretations of both the progress on the budget and the GDP report caused stocks to do something today that's become unusual. They sold off late in the session. Let's take a look at how trading progressed. Following yesterday's 179-point run-up in the Dow, stocks followed bonds lower on the open this morning. But within an hour, things started to turn around as the bond market reinterpreted the signs of inflation in the GDP report and helped to lift stocks a full 50 points by 1130. Then rumors began swirling that a balanced budget agreement was imminent, and the Dow rose another 25 points before peaking during the noon hour. But all the confusion caused some traders to take a more cautious stance before the close, and they sold off some positions, leaving the Dow with a gain of just 46.96, but still above a psychologically important century mark at 7,008.99. In today's 122-point trading range, the Dow finished down 48.5 points from the best level of the day and up 73.5 points from the low. Trading volume 556.1 million shares, that's 4.5 million shares above yesterday's level and the heaviest we've seen recently, and up volume top down volume by 284 million shares. The Dow transports were up 3.39, no change in the utilities, and the closing tick a bullish reading of plus 198. In the broader market, a strong reading with both the S&P 500 and 100 rising nearly 1%. The mid-cap 400 fared nicely as well. It rose two and a quarter. And the CR Bridge, CRB Bridge Futures Index gained 1.61 today. The New York Stock Exchange Index rose 3.32. Value line was up close to six points. The Russell 2000 rising 2.42. And the broadly-based Wilshire 5000 climbing almost 70 points. In the bond market, another economic report that we haven't mentioned yet helped to ease negative sentiment. The Purchasing Management Association of Chicago said its index of area business activity fell in April. Since the reading on the economy in this report is more timely than the GDP report, traders were reassured that the inflationary pressures may be easing and they eased long-term interest rates, which move in the opposite direction of bond prices, and they went back down to well below the 7% level. At the close of trade, tax-free and corporate issues were up a quarter point on average, and treasuries were up across the board, with five-year notes higher by 8.30 seconds, 10-year notes up 9.30 seconds, and 30-year government bonds up 10.30 seconds, with their yield down to 6.96%. Finally, the Lehman Brothers Long Bond Index climbed to 5.32 today. Later in the program, we'll look at individual stocks in detail. Jeff? And speaking of bonds, one in four Americans owns them, and they are now even more attractive. They are savings bonds. Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin today announced changes meant to improve their return, including having interest accrue monthly instead of every six months. Another change would hike the yield during the first five years after their purchase. Rubin is beefing up the bonds to encourage Americans to save. Improving this nation's savings rate has been a high priority of the Clinton administration. For the nation, higher savings means greater productivity and a stronger economy. And one other note out of Washington late today, the Senate confirmed Alexis Herman as Secretary of Labor by a vote of 85 to 13. Republicans allowed the vote after President Clinton agreed not to issue an executive order encouraging federal agencies to award construction contracts to union firms. Conseco's appetite for insurance companies is still strong. Conseco today agreed to buy Colonial Pen Life Insurance from Lucadia National for $460 million in cash and notes. Conseco expects the purchase to add a penny a share to this year's earnings. The company has bought at least 16 life insurance firms since 1982 and plans to buy more in the future. Also today, Conseco reported first quarter profits of 49 cents a share, up from 39 cents a year ago. Conseco stock lost an eighth to close at 41 and 3 eighths. Lucadia gained three quarters to close at 30 and 3 eighths. You probably wouldn't think of recreational vehicles as a growth industry, but some analysts might disagree. 
Industry growth has been moving sideways for years. Recently, though, there have been improvements in the sector that people, many people think are long-lasting. At first glance, recreational vehicles would hardly seem to be a growth industry. The models run the gamut from $5,000 pop-up trailers to motorhomes costing up to $150,000. This super luxury model is a $1 million item. But industry sales these days are only half of what they were nearly 20 years ago. Total sales peaked in 1978 at half a million vehicles. But the last three years have shown increasingly stronger sales. The question is why? Part of the answer is the boomer generation. Manufacturers say age 50 to mid-60s are when people are most likely to buy an RV like this one. And that's precisely the age bracket that the baby boom generation is just now entering into. The long-term aspect is, is excellent when you stop to think that this is one of the uh, main beneficiaries of the aging of the World War baby boom, which should peak somewhere around the year 2005. Uh, just think of uh, uh, all the people who retire and, and, would, and would like to uh, use recreational vehicles as an adjunct to their uh, retirement years. Manufacturers say new sales in previous years were also held back by the glut of used RVs left over from the 1970s. That hurt new sales for years afterward. These units, as they aged, uh, became uh, competition during the 1980s for new product because they became used product. And so we had a lot of used products uh, competing for the same dollars that the new products were trying to compete for. Analysts say improved designs and better quality materials have also helped sales. One innovation is the so-called slide-out, which gives a parked RV more interior room. What could hurt sales? Higher interest rates possibly, but half of the RVs sold are paid for in cash. Analysts say the big factor is fuel supplies. Should the fuel shocks of the 1970s return, that might be enough to curtail the industry's boom. The RV industry has also launched a television marketing campaign similar to the ones we've seen from the milk industry or pork producers. Still ahead on Nightly Business Report, it could save your business time and money. Employee telecommuting is becoming more and more popular across the United States. The U.S. Justice Department is investigating possible bid rigging during the federal government's auctioning of wireless phone licenses. The FCC raised more than $20 billion since 1995 by selling licenses for personal communication services. Documents obtained by Reuters show the probe is also looking into whether bidders illegally scheme to divide up the PCS licenses being sold. And Cassie, FCC Chairman Reed Hunt declined comment to nightly business report about the investigation. Well, Jeff, the stock market also declined an opportunity today when it challenged record highs but then pulled back. But it still ended up nearly 47 points at 7,008.99. Advancing issues had a commanding lead over decliners. There were 13 new highs for the year and 37 new lows. Philip Morris topped the big board's most active list. Just over 8 million shares changed hands. There was heavy options trading in the stock, but it finished unchanged. PepsiCo gained a half. Chrysler fell three-eighths. AT&T rose a quarter. AT&T is raising the rates it charges businesses for toll-free numbers by 7% beginning tomorrow. AT&T says the move will help it offset fees it's required to pay to the owners of pay telephones. And Scientific Atlanta picked up an eighth today. Electronic data systems rose a half, but computer giant IBM climbed two and an eighth. Walmart ended up three-eighths. Compaq rose one and an eighth, and Coca-Cola gained one full point, tenth in big board volume. Among widely held issues, Bay Networks rose one and a quarter. The CFO made an upbeat presentation on Bay Networks' internet switching product at a Hambrecht and Quist conference on the West Coast. He says revenues will be flat this year, but look for improvements in 1998. Boeing gained two and a half. Computer Associates rose two and five eighths. Delta Air fell one and a quarter. First Union gained two and five eighths. And Union Pacific ending up one and three eighths. Union Pacific wants to control Mexico's second largest rail line. Today's Wall Street Journal says the company and two other Mexican firms are bidding for the rail line. 
The percentage gainer of the day was Center Metals. The stock plowed through its 52-week high, rising 9.5. The British defense firm GKN submitted a $570 million offer to acquire Center. I'm told nearly half of Center shareholders plan to accept the offer. Boston Scientific soaring five and three quarters. Investors forgave Boston Scientific's early profit warning once the real numbers were released. First quarter earnings came in at 40 cents a share. The street was looking for 47 cents. There were no downside surprises there. West Corp rose one and a half despite posting lower first quarter profits of 30 cents a share versus 38 cents a year ago. Mortgages and consumer loans helped non-interest income top 50 million dollars. And Green Tree Financial tacked on two and three eighths. Morgan Stanley issued a strong buy on the stock. Apria Healthcare climbed one and an eighth on better than expected first quarter earnings of 37 cents a share. Results were a penny above street estimates. And then in the minus column, Imation Corp dropped one and a quarter. The company is concerned about the impact the strong dollar is having on its bottom line. Revenues are not expected to improve much this year, and first quarter profits rose slightly to 30 cents a share from 29 cents a year ago. In NASDAQ trading, the composite index elbowed its way to higher ground, rising 18.13. Volume, 657 million shares. There were 172 more stocks up than down. Topping the NASDAQ, Intel jumped three and an eighth. Goldman Sachs is recommending Intel, along with other stocks that have fallen in price recently. Back in February, Intel stood at 164 and change. Goldman says at these levels, Intel looks like a bargain. Microsoft rose two and a half. Cisco Systems ended up one and three quarters. Dell Computer up 15 sixteenths. And Ascend Communications rising four and five sixteenths. Independent research firm Wall Street Strategies says money managers are still boycotting the networking group, but the stocks could run up as much as 100% by year's end once money managers revisit the battered group. Applied Materials gained one and an eighth, while Oracle edged an eighth higher. WorldCom moved up three quarters. WorldCom posted better than expected first quarter earnings of five cents a share versus 20 cents a year ago. Quantum climbed almost two points, and L.M. Erickson jumped two and an eighth. Merrill Lynch named the Swedish telecommunications giant as its focus stock of the week. The NASDAQ Big Movers graphics software maker MetaTools climbed to the company's latest acquisition. Real-time geometry has developed a 3D technology that allows images to be easily manipulated. And the British firm Esprit Telecom Group tumbled two and five sixteenths. The company says profits are expected to fall due to an overload in network capacity. Then finally on the NASDAQ, SunQuest information systems fell one and five eighths on flat first quarter earnings of eight cents a share. Then over on the American exchange, the composite index jumped almost five points, volume down a bit from yesterday. There were only 24 more stocks up than down. Heading up the Amex most active list, trading three million shares were S&P depository receipts remaining on a roll thanks to the strong performance in the S&P 500. They rose uh, three-eighths today. And then among the big movers, Brosk and Limited gained two and a quarter. And then finally, investors checked out of units in Red Lion Inns. The stock dropped one and a half. Red Lion posted a first quarter loss of 13 cents per unit. And that's the Wall Street wrap-up. Jeff? Technology is uh, supposed to make our lives easier, but many people say they just end up working longer hours instead. But some are embracing telecommuting as a way to make those hours more productive. From San Francisco, Jim Bolden looks at the trend's growing popularity. The San Mateo Bridge, one of the arteries of Silicon Valley, 5 p.m. This eight-mile span across the San Francisco Bay can bring chaos to employees and companies. But since no one here pretends they are going to work fewer hours, Many are substituting the time in the car with time in front of the home computer, one to two days a week. Citizens of California, you may now work at home. The area's baby Bell has an entire telecommuting resources division and is trying to keep up with demand for more and faster phone lines into homes. Several years ago, it was not uncommon for someone to request an additional line. Today, we see homes with four and five lines. Um, we're playing a little bit of uh, catch up, but I believe that through our work with the work at home customer, we've anticipated the future. PC World magazine took a look at telecommuting around the country. A mixture of factors, including flexible bosses, good internet access, coupled with computer driven jobs and lousy traffic, makes the Bay Area number one on its list. Also rated high, Los Angeles, Boston, Atlanta. Mid sized areas such as Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, and Manchester, New Hampshire also scored well. But not on the list at all, cozy hideaways. What we envisioned were lots of pictures of people by babbling brooks in, in the Rockies. And what we found out is really still concentrated in large metro areas. 
yet those large metro areas are getting more congested and more costly the high cost of housing in cities is forcing many people who want to own homes to move way out of town for instance these houses are going up ninety miles from san francisco and the silicon valley for these people telecommuting is certainly a blessing one day a week dusty peterson and some of her colleagues stay home at their jobs for perkin elmer's biotech division she says she gets more work done that way because she's not suffering a two to three hour commute each way. By telecommuting one day a week, I am re-energized. I get an extra two hours in the morning. Um, as opposed to waking up at 3.30 a.m., I get to sleep in until 5.30 a.m. Great benefit. Oh, you bet. <laughs> but observers say people lucky enough to telecommute still have to travel to work most days. And that is not going to change anytime soon. And unfortunately, if you have the luxury of turning back on the home computer after dinner to put in a few more hours of work, you probably will. Jim Bolden for Nightly Business Report, San Francisco. Tomorrow, Chrysler and General Motors report April sales figures as both companies cope with ongoing strikes. American brand shareholders today voted to spin off the company's UK-based tobacco business. That makes internal revenue service approval of the tax-free deal the only hurdle left for American brands to clear. American's board has set May 30th as the spin-off date for its Gallagher, uh, Gallagher Tobacco unit. The new company will be called Fortune Brands. American brand shares close the day up a quarter at 53 and three quarters. Mapmaker Rand McNally is looking to cash in on the high prices media companies are bringing these days. The privately owned firm has retained investment bank Goldman Sachs to explore the possible sale of the company. The 141-year-old firm cited a commitment to keeping the Rand McNally brand name a leader in the commercial map-making field as a reason for the possible sale. In the Money File tonight, James Glassman, financial columnist for the Washington Post, says if you're in the market for stocks, you might want to look close to home. A few weeks ago, with the market down by hundreds of points, one of my colleagues asked me to recommend a good blue chip stock. Johnson & Johnson, I suggested. Already own it. Okay, Gillette. Own it. What about Microsoft and Intel? Own them. Pepsi, General Electric, Hewlett Packard. I named it. He owned it. Then, tapped out, I made another suggestion. Why don't you just buy more of what you already own? I'll never know whether he took me up on the idea, but it's a good one for investors to bear in mind. Diversification is fine, but only up to a point, and that point arrives quite quickly. Academic research shows that you need to own only eight to 10 stocks, as long as they're in different sectors, in order to reduce the risk that comes from over-concentration. Owning 100 stocks isn't much safer than owning 10. In fact, it could be more dangerous, since you can't really know and follow the companies you're buying. Which brings me to some great advice from the late investment genius Benjamin Graham. Think of buying stocks as becoming a partner in a great company. In fact, as Graham's most famous student, super investor Warren Buffett put it, a lot of great fortunes in the world have been made by owning a single wonderful business. One is too few for most of us, but if you find a half dozen or so companies you like, keep buying their stock. You'll be a bigger partner and your investing life will be easier and more profitable. I'm Jim Glassman. And finally tonight, McDonald's may be in for a bit of a surprise when the science fiction movie The Fifth Element opens. The film's director worked with the company to design a McDonald's that is set 200 years in the future, but only for the building. The costume designer was on his own for what the employees might wear, so Jean-Paul Gaultier put the women in uniforms featuring blue metallic Dutch boy wigs and red and yellow outfits that show a lot of cleavage. Definitely not your typical fast food frocks. The movie opens May 9th. 
And that's, night, that's, uh, that's Nightly Business Report for Wednesday, April 30th. I'm Jeff Yastin in Miami. Good night, Cassie. Good night, Jeff. I'm Cassie Seifert in New York. We'll see you again tomorrow. Good night. Nightly Business Report is made possible by A.G. Edwards, helping businesses raise capital, structure executive compensation programs, and address complex financial challenges. A.G. Edwards, trusted advice, exceptional service. Franklin Templeton, serving investors for over 50 years. Franklin Templeton, and now Mutual Series, investment products distributed by investment professionals. Digital, helping all kinds of businesses like the American Stock Exchange build network systems they can grow with. Digital, whatever it takes. And by the financial support of viewers like you. Business Report has a video for anyone who's thinking about investing in stocks. It's How Wall Street Works, winner of the American Film and Video Festival's Blue Ribbon Award. To order by credit card, call 1-800-535-5864.